Thanks for joining us for this archive of Teaching American History's Documents and Detail webinar for February 19th, 2020. We had over 130 teachers join us live as Drs. Jason Stevens, Jeff Sikinga, and Peter Myers <clears throat> discussed the landmark Supreme Court case Plessy versus Ferguson. All right, I've got a seven o'clock, so why don't we go ahead and get started? Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Jason Stevens, visiting assistant professor of political science and history at Ashland University and director of teacher programs at the Ashbrook Center. Welcome to another episode of Documents in Detail, Teaching American History's webinar series in which we bring together thoughtful scholars to have a conversation about historically important documents. We encourage all of you joining us today uh, to participate in that conversation by submitting your questions via the chat box, uh, and we'll try to get to as many of those as possible over the course of the next hour. Uh, within the next week, you will receive an email with a link to request a certificate of participation, as well as a link to the archived video and audio from today's program. The speeches, letters, and other writings that we're using for this year's webinars are all drawn from our book, 50 Core American Documents. They are also available at the Ashbrook Center's extensive document database located at teachingamericanhistory.org or tah.org. That works too. The subject of today's program, <clears throat> excuse me, the subject of today's program is the 1896 Supreme Court case Plessy versus Ferguson. And to help discuss it are Dr. Jeff Sikinga, Professor of Political Science at Ashland University and Interim Executive Director of the Ashbrook Center, and Dr. Peter Myers, Professor of Political Science at University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire. Uh, gentlemen, welcome. Thank you, uh, thank you for being with us tonight. Delighted to be here. Yep, happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Wonderful. Okay, so why don't we, um, let's not mess around with just dipping our toes in the water here. Let's jump right in uh, to this document. And I guess my, my first question to, that I'll pose to, to the both of you is um, why is this document so important? Why is this document worth studying, worth taking seriously? Uh, all right, I'll take uh, I'll take a couple of short cracks at that, and then uh, Jeff can Jeff can fill in. Um, it's well, it's it's tremendously important both culturally and and I think constitutionally. Um, uh, the, the the cultural importance, at least in the in the conventional wisdom, is that it's really kind of a catastrophe uh, that it uh, that it is a major setback for the cause of uh, of equal rights, irrespective of, of race or color. And and I say conventional wisdom. I think that conventional wisdom is largely, but not perfectly, true. Uh, um, it is of major importance in constitutional law. It's a kind of a landmark ruling in a way, although it is not, I think, again, at least in the conventional wisdom about it, it's not very well understood. So it's nice that, uh, that we're going to have this, that we're going to have this discussion about it. Um, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll let that sit for now, just as a couple of introductory comments. I think I would add, just to add to that, on the uh, on the constitutional side at least, it's um, it is a significant opinion that has to be um, any any th thought of the civil rights struggle of the 20th century, obviously has to take some of its bearing from Plessy versus Ferguson, and the legal strategy adopted, for example, by the NAACP in fighting legalized segregation. So it, it not only was important in sort of enshrining constitutionally a certain cultural uh, norm and thereby, th I think, strengthening it, but also um, creating a very, very difficult uphill legal fight for um, civil rights groups. Not insurmountable, obviously, in the end. And I think it's a, and one of the things I think that's been misunderstood about it is what is, in fact, its relationship with Brown versus Board of Education? That a lot of folks, I think, misunderstand that relationship. So I, I hope that's something we can talk about as we go forward. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, both of you uh, 
first of all, very, very interesting remarks, but also both of you have commented that this is a document, a, a case that is not very well understood um, by modern uh, by modern audiences. And so I'd, I'd like to maybe flesh some of that out over the course of, of the next hour. Um, but maybe the, the place to go to to next is just maybe getting some some background, necessary background to the case itself. Right. So the, the context in which the, the case uh, appears and the, the facts or the background of, of the case itself, what's what's going on here? I don't know, maybe one or the other can can take the lead on on answering that. Well, I could say a couple of things about that. Uh, the <clears throat> the this is um, the Louisiana statute that is being contested here was enacted in 1890. That fact alone maybe surprises some people who are inclined who may be inclined to think that as soon as uh, Union troops leave the ex-rebel states, you know, post-1877, that a regime of Jim Crow instantly sweeps over the, um, the, the old Confederacy. And that's not quite true. Um, it took a decade or so for uh, the impulse to separate. Now, there were all kinds of other inequalities, uh, but uh, but it took a little while for the impulse to separate to be enacted into law. That doesn't mean that there wasn't, um, what should we say, customary separation of races in various kinds of public accommodations. There, there was before that, and, uh, and in 1890, really the first of these laws was enacted in 1887, I think. Uh, and then there's a wave of them in the first five years, 1887, 1892, that the Louisiana law is part of that. Uh, and then there's a second wave after Plessy that begins in around 18, 1898 or so. This is mostly in the, in the states of the Old South. I don't mean to say that that was simply a regional phenomenon. There was northern segregation at this time also. The term Jim Crow did not arise in the late 19th century. The term Jim Crow was actually around um, from the 1830s onward, and it referred to segregated institutions, at least from the 1840s onward. Um, so this is a this is a, a fairly common thing: the separation of races in uh, certainly in schools um, and uh, and also in uh, transportation conveyances. Uh, but it gets codified into law, which is something kind of new around this time uh, and uh, New Orleans in a way is the perfect place to challenge it or so thought uh, Plessy's attorneys but that part of the story we can maybe we can maybe tell as we go. Hmm. Yeah, I would just add to what Peter was saying at the, at the end there and maybe maybe we will get to more of it in the story but um, uh, Louisiana in particular New Orleans I think everyone knows was a more um, racially variegated place than other places in the Deep South. So th there had been mixed race people, for example, for a very long time in Louisiana, in particular in New Orleans, almost a, cl a class of folks like that, um, to which, uh, which Plessy was understood to be a part, actually. So mm -hmm. um, that, that adds to the, that adds, I think, to the significance of the case because black and white had not been so black and white always in Louisiana. And we see a movement, this kind of movement, uh, post-Civil War, and as Peter was saying, really post uh, sort of in the 1880s and, and after, uh, toward a kind of separation that had been cultural, as he said, but not legal and not as the, the racial um, boundaries had been a little more permeable in a place like that than they had been elsewhere. So I think that's another part of the significance of this case. Yeah, let me uh, let me let me add in turn a little bit to what Jeff is saying because that's a that's a very important point. Um, the this this is Plessy. Um, let me back up. The the separate train cars act, the 1890 law that's being challenged here, had kind of a unifying effect among uh, the New Orleans. I would, uh, for lack of a better term, I'll call them people of color. But that was, in fact, a distinct, even linguistic category during the day. Uh, you know, the, there's a French legacy, of course, in, uh, in New Orleans. There was the, the class, the term to refer to this class of people 
of mixed race was Jean de Coleur, uh, was, you know, people of color. And those were distinguished from, uh, again, for lack of, of more, uh, more precise language, um, purely black people. And there was some friction between those two classes. The latter were more closely associated with slavery. The former were not uh, a class who enjoyed full civil and political rights, but they had more rights and more social respect than the people who were purely black. And they were particularly outraged um, for, for all these reasons by, uh, by the enactment of that law. And, uh, and so it was out of this class, which, uh, which had representatives of some professional accomplishment. These were the people who organized a citizens committee, who raised the money, who hired the attorneys to challenge this law. Um, that's what I meant when I said uh, that, uh, that New Orleans was kind of was kind of the perfect place for this law to be mm. to be challenged. Well, that's re that's really that's interesting, and that's also I mean very helpful I think when it comes to understanding the context what the, what is going on um, not just in Louisiana but in the in the country as well at the time of this case. Uh, so along those along those same lines, can you um, can somebody tell me maybe something about who is who is Homer Plessy? Uh, I understand maybe a little bit about the the law that is at stake in this case, but but who's Homer Plessy? How does how does his case reach the Supreme Court? Uh, who, who is who is Ferguson? Jeff, Jeff, you want to speak to that, or I can I can do that either way. It doesn't matter. Go ahead, Peter. Okay. Well, as far as I know, this maybe is a good uh, is a good opportunity for Jeff to clean up after me in this in this respect. Uh, not a whole lot is known of Homer Plessy. He was a 30 year old man. He, um, by virtually all accounts, so far as I know, there are no surviving pictures of him. So we we can't know quite exactly what he looked like. By all accounts, he he could pass for a white. The, the legend around the case is that he was what is called an octoroon, meaning he was one-eighth black, which if you do the figuring of that a little bit, would mean that he had one black great-grandparent, and that established him at least customarily as a person of color rather than a white person uh, in, the, in the culture of the day. I, in, in my reading surrounding the case, I find that Apparently, the likelier truth is that he was about one quarter black, um, which would put it to one black grandparent instead of great grandparent. But still, everybody says that he could he could pass for whites uh, for a white. He identified himself uh, with uh, with the community of with the community of color. And beyond that, I I am not it, well, I don't know what uh, really what further is known about him. How the case arose, maybe maybe Jeff, you wanna you wanna speak to that? Peter, could you say a little bit more um, in your research on Plessy and community of color? Um, a little bit more, if we know anything about the organizers of of the challenge to the case, because that's yeah, such an interesting story. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well. Well. I, do you? I mean, you, if you know the story, go no, ahead. Please go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Then. Um, uh what was your guy's name the the there was a man who was um a quite accomplished man um a newspaper either editor publisher also a lawyer and also a physician named a man of many talents <laughs> yes named uh now i'm going to anglicize the pronunciation i'm not sure i'm not sure how exactly you would pronounce it louis martinet would be the the anglicized way of pronouncing it who was, I suppose, foremost among the people outraged by the passage of the Separate Train Car Act. Uh, so he establishes this committee of people called the Citizens Committee for Civil Rights or something like that. Um, so they set about trying to find an attorney. Well, two things. They set about thinking about what would be a good way of framing a challenge case. And then they set about trying to find an attorney. Uh, in steps, um, you know, the person they found is, I like to say this when I'm talking about him to my you know, undergrads as well as to teacher audiences. The person they found is the greatest 19th century advocate of civil rights of whom nobody anymore has ever heard, 
who is who is Albion Tourget as this kind of swashbuckling uh, you know French French ancestry name. Um, briefly about Tourget. Tourget is a really fascinating character. He's a really fascinating story in himself. He is um, a native of Ohio. He is a child of French Huguenots, actually. A native of Ohio. Um, uh, served the quick story is he served in the Civil War. He becomes radicalized in the anti-slavery direction by his service in the Civil War. Fairly seriously wounded, uh, so he's forced out of uh, active participation in the war. Middle 1860s, studies law, so becomes a lawyer. And then at the end of the war, he decides he's going to become. Of course, this wouldn't have been his term. A carpetbagger. Um, the better way maybe of describing it is he wanted to be one of the founding fathers uh, in the, of the New South. So he moves down to, to North Carolina, quickly gets into politics, participates in um, the, 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 the Constitutional Convention. Of course, all the old Confederate states had to, had to revise their constitutions um, and, uh, uh, and also served as a judge. And, uh, and uh, and battled the Klan, and uh, you know, Tourget is a man of great accomplishment. He, he battled the Klan in North Carolina for a decade or so. In uh, 1879 and 1880, he wrote two novels that were bestsellers that were hugely influential in their day. Um, uh, they're, they're great stories. One of them is called A Fool's Errand, which is kind of autobiographical about his years in, um, uh, in North Carolina. The other one is called Bricks Without Straw, which is a chronicling of events in late Reconstruction uh, from the point of view of Black people, of freed people. Um, so he writes these books, then he becomes a newspaper columnist, and so he's a, he's a kind of famous activist of his, of his day. This is the guy that, uh, that Martinet thinks of as, uh, as the representative for Plessy. And Tourget, um, writes much of, he has a partner in the, in, the, in the case, a local attorney named James Walker. So it isn't clear exactly who wrote what in the brief, but it's likely that Tourget wrote the, the constitutional arguments and probably wrote the most eccentric of the arguments in that brief that we can maybe talk about down the road. Um, but it was essential to his strategy uh, in, uh, in, um, in bringing the case that he wanted somebody who could pass for white. And so he wanted someone like Homer Plessy. And that's how they, uh, that's, that's ultimately, that's how they came upon Plessy. This is one of those examples that we'll sometimes use talking to students about um, plaintiff shopping, mm -hmm. sometimes mm -hmm. called today. <laughs> yeah. Finding yeah. exactly the right and most sympathetic plaintiff, especially for the kind of uh, legal and constitutional arguments that you're going to make. And I think we can add to what Peter was saying that uh, a particularly interesting aspect of the case, which I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with, is which is the railroads themselves mm. yeah. were not delighted by the law. Mm -hmm. uh, mm. And um, some people have even suggested, although I, I would defer to Peter on this, I don't think there's historical evidence for this, that they were, if not directly supportive of the challenge, certainly not looking in any way to impede it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think um, we can. Yeah, I, I think that's that's right. And you can say something a little stronger even about the, at least the particular railroads that was involved, its participation. What, what I've read indicates that up to this time, you know, before this this uh, this series of laws was passed, it was up to the railroads to decide whether they wanted to segregate passengers or not. And some did and some didn't. It was just sort of a mixture in the, uh, in the, in the Old South. Um, and uh, so they found one that, that didn't. Um, and they didn't like the law really just because it, it to them, added a needless expense. Um, it, you know, it, it forced them to... Uh, uh, to use more cars to accommodate the same number of passengers, um, and it, I'm sure they didn't like the fact that it that it would have generated irritation among uh, among at least some portion of their passengers. So yeah, the railroad was actively in on this. Um, that um, you know they wouldn't have known. I mean, not knowing who Homer Plessy was, they wouldn't have known that he was a person of color, and so they wouldn't have known uh, to unseat him. 
from the from the white train car unless they had been pre-advised about it. And so they were pre-advised. They wanted uh, they set up somebody to bring a complaint, another a white passenger who would know who Plessy was, who would bring the complaint. Then the conductor would have to remove Plessy, and then and then law enforcement would get involved. And that's how they. It had to be a criminal violation. Uh, and uh, um, in order for them to bring the case the way they wanted to, and that's how the that's how the case got uh, got in motion. Fascinating. That wow. Thank you for that background. That was um, not just you know enlightening when it comes to trying to understand the case, but it's just the way you you hearing you two talk about this. It's just it's it's very insightful. Um, and but I want to talk about something Jeff brought up and moving into the the case itself. Um, those legal and constitutional arguments um, that are made both by Brown in defending the law and in, and by Harlan against the law, they 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 both rely on the Thirteenth and Fourteenth Amendments. Mm -hmm. But I wonder if maybe we we can we can flesh out flesh out some of those some of those arguments. Um, what, what do we what do we see from uh, from the majority? Right. I mean, Harlan is the lone dissenter. Right. So all the rest of the the court. Uh, side with uh, with with Brown's opinion. Um, what is what is that opinion? And can I take just one step back from that? Yeah, and sure. Say, I I think, and we see this in her in, in Brown's opinion. But just to, to take <clears throat> a step back and say, I think it's important to to um, recover um, Louisiana's arguments. Hmm. Which Brown uh, takes up and, and buys, obviously, and accepts mm -hmm. in, in, in mm -hmm. to a large degree. But if, if we understand their arguments, I think we can understand the the dialogue, the conversation, the dispute that's going on between these uh, two sides. I think it's really important mm -hmm. when we read Supreme Court opinions not to think of them as sort of abstract legal treatises, mm -hmm. which sometimes we like to think, and sometimes they read like Pat very often, and so it's very right. easy to understand. But these are live arguments between um, litigants, not just litigants, mm. but between justices. Mm. They're arguing between themselves. They, this is the, you know, the, the opinion is the product of a long series of events very often mm. in which the conversation has been going on a while. So not just an oral argument, mm. of course, but also um, in chambers, among themselves, in briefs. And so we often find that there is a sort of um, a dialectic, a back and forth mm. between the arguments. And if we just read them as straight treatise, we, we sometimes forget. So you, I think it's important to sort of read Brown's argument on the 13th Amendment, understand what Louisiana's argument is in defending the law, mm. read Brown's argument in accepting the, the parts of it, and then we go to, to Harlan and then back and forth in a certain mm. way. So I, I would just say that Louisiana's argument is predicated on this notion, which the Supreme Court had accepted in many rulings prior to this case, um, including some not not very uh, much prior, just a few years prior, that states have what are called police powers. And by that, the court holds they have the power to regulate um, people's actions, people's behavior, for the sake of public safety, public health, public morals, and public welfare. And th those powers were held to be very broad, even to the point, for example, of um, uh, Midwestern legislatures in counties and states uh, abolishing alcohol before we get to prohibition mm -hmm. on, on the federal level. So very broad powers uh, for public welfare, and in fact, perhaps broader more broadly ruled in the late 19th century than other previous times. So the court, what Louisiana, Louisiana argues is this was a legitimate exercise of the police powers. We are segregating the races on rail cars for the sake of public order and public safety. Mm -hmm. So they say we are not creating a racial tension. A racial tension exists. Our law is in response to that racial tension, which is and which requires, therefore, keeping people separate. So for public safety, keeping, preventing any racial conflict, and for public order, just to prevent irritation and facilitate ease and comfort of travel of, for people on a public conveyance, which is what railroads were understood to be by then, um, 
they said the state has a legitimate role in exercise of its police powers, just as it does in you know, regulating speed limits, regulating sewers, and all kinds of ordinary municipal regulations for public health, safety, welfare, and morals. And that, that we can't forget, was, had a wide latitude given to it by the Supreme Court in previous rulings. So I think we would, I would start just by mm-hmm. noting that fact. I would add just a, yeah, just a further point kind of to intensify that point. Because I, I, I mean, everything I, that Jeff said, I think, is exactly right, uh, and that is um, that the, the the desire to preserve state police powers is is quite strong in the uh, in the later part of the 19th century, and in a way, it's quite strong as a consequence of the enactment of the of the 14th Amendment. And the reason is that the the tradition of constitutional federalism. <laughs> greatly eroded uh, in our own day, right? The idea of states' rights is is in somewhat bad order and uh, bad odor, sorry, and has been for a long time. Uh, and it's been um, uh, you know, the, the the idea that uh, well, the, the the doctrine that there are you know really strong reserved powers to the states has taken a lot of hits in the course of 20th century jurisprudence. But in the 19th century, especially in the post-Civil War, a lot of people, people of goodwill, right, um, who, are, who are not necessarily full of bigotry with regard to race questions are uneasy um, about enacting what they would have regarded as a constitutional revolution in relations between uh, uh, the powers of the states and the powers of the federal government. And so... Uh, there is an understanding that the 14th Amendment has changed this relation some, but there is also a desire, a fairly powerful desire to uh, to confine the scope of those changes and therefore to respect as much as reasonably possible of the of the traditional states' police powers. Which are you know, which can, which are the regulatory powers that uh, that, that Jeff was talking about. Mm-hmm. So there's a kind of a presumption in favor of uh, of uh, of the preservation of uh, uh, the sort of power that Louisiana is claiming here. Mm-hmm. And, and how would uh, no? Go ahead, sorry, yeah, go ahead, just, Jeff. just a, a couple of cases. If I'm sure the uh, many of the teachers have heard of these cases, but. To support uh, Peter's point, there are a couple of important precedents on the 14th Amendment and the court's, um, what you might call a more narrow reading of it, to not have a kind of constitutional revolution in federalism. Mm -hmm. Slaughterhouse cases Mm -hmm. from 1873, of course, a very famous one, and then that was a a closer decision. And then the civil rights cases in 1883, in which uh, Justice Harlan was again the lone dissenter, or was first the lone dissenter, and now in Plessy, of course, he's again the lone dissenter. Those are two cases where the court uh, does exactly what Peter was saying and had cited very strongly the presumption of preserving states' police powers against federal power. Hmm. That's good. So um, how, would, how would Homer Plessy or how would Justice Harlan respond to, to those claims by the state of Louisiana that to, to, regulate the, um, to regulate their railroad cards on the basis of race – uh, is within the scope of the the state's police powers, um, according to to Harlan, uh, or even, right, even you know taking Plessy's case here. Um, how has the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments changed the scope of those police powers? Well, I guess about that. I'm sorry, Jeff. Do you want to jump in? Go ahead. No, I, w- I was going to just say that the the fundamental argument they make is. Um, and, and Turgey was, of course, as Peter said, one of the sort of architect of these arguments, mm-hmm. which Harlan then takes up, is that there really was a significant change in the constitutional order with the 13th and 14th Amendments. So the argument on the 13th Amendment is in abolishing slavery, the amendment creates universal civil freedom, the way that it's talked about. And so it's not just simply the abolition of the technical legal ownership of one person by another, but in eliminating that legal uh, ownership of one person by another, full universal civil freedom is restored to people, which was artificially and wrongly uh, 
taken away by legalized slavery. So that the 13th Amendment was essentially a restoration of the natural freedom of human beings on a civic level. And that means, for example, as, as Justice Harlan said, uh, free people have the right to sit where they please, as long as they're not disturbing somebody else. They have the right to sit where they please. Mm-hmm. And for example, the law would pro- prohibit a, a black man and a white man from sitting together, even if they were friends in the same car. And isn't it part of just being a free human being, not being a slave, a free human being, to sit where you please with whom you mm-hmm. please? And so there was a very broad reading of the 13th Amendment as not just doing away in a technical legal way, but reestablishing a kind of philosophical moral principle and bringing that principle in the law in every state. Mm. Yeah, that's, yeah, all, all, all very good. Um, I, to, to that, I would add a couple of things. There, there is in Harlan's, um, in Harlan's, Harlan's dissent is, is a little more complicated maybe um, than, than again is, is commonly understood. There's, there, there is exactly that personal liberty consideration that the 13th Amendment is to be understood <clears throat> as having this broad implication. It's not just non-slavery. It's not just a repudiation of chattel slavery. It is an affirmation of, uh, of civil liberty. Uh, and civil liberty certainly includes a right of free association. And the free association right is being violated by, by statutes like the like the separate the separate train car act, there is that, uh, and there's also a consideration of republican government, uh, and that uh, in in Harlan's reading, these uh, these reconstruction amendments 13 and 14, well really 13, 14 and 15, um, but let's focus on 13 and 14, are enacted to perfect the idea of republican government at the heart of which is equal citizenship, mm-hmm. and so. Um, uh, another another corollary of that is that uh, I think you know between the lines of Harlan's opinion is this idea, and this comes out more strongly in his dissent in the civil rights cases, uh, for which interestingly in the day he was more famous than uh, than the Plessy dissent. But anyway, um, in the um, in in between the lines is the idea that it's a mistake to get i think as we commonly do to get too caught up in the in the section 1 clauses the familiar ones anyway of the 14th amendment the privileges or immunities and now especially the due process and equal protection clauses for harlan the 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 clause of fundamental importance is the one that comes before that is the is the affirmation of citizenship of mm. equal citizenship of all people, you know, born in the U.S. and under the jurisdiction, uh, and uh, and so for Harlan, citizenship comes with a bundle of rights, but among or within that bundle of rights is a new right, is essentially a right against invidious discrimination, uh, and so it's that it's that right also that he thinks is being violated here because such discrimination is simply inimical to the idea of, uh, of Republican government. Um, one, one last point, you were saying, you asked originally, how would Harlan respond to the things that Justice Brown, who interestingly was from Massachusetts himself, uh, things that Justice Brown says about the police power. Um, I, I'll, I'm, I'm looking at a, a text of, uh, of Brown's ruling as I'm talking to you. So, reading what I'll read what Brown says first uh, when he, he he recites a few arguments that the, the plaintiffs make, and then he says the reply to all this is that every exercise of the police power must be reasonable and extend only to such laws as are enacted in good faith for the promotion of the public good and not for the annoyance or oppression of a particular class. Now, that's kind of interesting. That's, that's Brown's statement of, of uh, at least a portion of, his, of the test he brings to this case. So he says, if you can demonstrate to me that the law in question was in fact designed, you know, as we would say, to stigmatize, that it was invidious, it was designed for the annoyance or, or oppression of a, of a particular class, then I would join you in, in validating it. 
but I don't think it was. It, you know, the state has to show uh, at least some plausible reason to think that the law was enacted in, Brown, in Brown's words, in good faith for the promotion of the public good. And those were the police powers reasons that Jeff was talking about, about the preservation of public order. And, and Brown makes a reference to the, the customs and usages established among people and, and, uh, and so forth. That was good enough for Brown. And <clears throat> Harlan's response to that, to that particular point can be put really in kind of blunt terms. Harlan just disagrees on the claim of fact. Harlan thinks that that claim of good faith is fraudulent. Um, he says, uh, uh, if I can, I can, I'm scrolling down as I'm talking to you to find it. There's a passage in which he says, look, everybody knows what the, what the motivation of the legislature was. Um, uh, he says that, uh, that the motivation of the legislature was essentially to assign a badge of servitude, to, to declare that blacks are unfit for the association, for association with, uh, with white people. Uh, and that's, that's an invidious discrimination. Um, and, uh, and therefore, it is, it is unconstitutional. So, so Brown would say, in response to Harlan, if the law stigmatizes members of the the black race that is not part of the law but that is merely the the response of yeah black americans to that law yeah he calls that the fallacy in the plaintiff's argument he says mm -hmm. that it's, it's just a subjective response on their part mm -hmm. but there's nothing really inherent in the meaning of the mm -hmm. law and there's nothing at least demonstrated with regard to the intention of the legislature that justifies mm -hmm. that that construction of the law mm -hmm. and harlan harlan disagrees harlan thinks that's just contrary to to common sense yeah mm -hmm. and, and there i think you see the dialect the, the conversation back and forth right as peter was saying brown lays out the test that the law has to be a reasonable exercise of the police powers not for the annoyance of a particular class of people Harlan's response to that is, everybody knows it's designed for the annoyance of a particular class of people, to which Brown's response is, well, you, that has to be proven, and it hasn't been proven. And why does it have to be proven? Because we have to presume that, that, that states are exercising their police powers in good faith until the otherwise shown. So here we have, I think, a good example of the importance of the previous decisions affirming a wide range of state police powers. It's up to the people challenging the government to prove that it's unreasonable. It's not up to government to prove that it is reasonable. And absent any compelling evidence otherwise, he has to say, well, I think we can presume that this was a reasonable regulation for public order and public safety. Mm -hmm. Which then, I think, of course, leads to the next and perhaps even most famous argument of Harlan, saying, well, even if that's true, the law is still unconstitutional. And that's when he begins his discussion of the colorblind yeah. constitution. Right, right. So why don't, we, why don't we go to that point next, right? Because that is, right, as you said, probably the, the most famous part of Harlan's defense, uh, dissent, and rightly so, his argument that the Constitution is itself colorblind. And can we can we flesh that out a bit? What are his reasons for believing that? And then what's what what would be Brown's what is Brown's response? Um, his argument relies mostly on the the Fourteenth Amendment. All right. right. The I'll, I'll take Brown's response and then uh, and then say a word or two about Harlan. Um, Brown's response is that there is. Um, that the history of the 14th Amendment, in, I mean, meaning the intention of the framers of the 14th, and then the subsequent usage, including subsequent Supreme mm -hmm. Court interpretations, suggests that the Constitution, even as amended, even incorporating the 14th Amendment, the Constitution does not categorically forbid classifications by race. In fact, you know, that really follows directly from the police powers point we were just, we were just talking about. Um, when Brown says the classification has to be reasonable, if you can 
um, if you can, you know, the, what Louisiana is doing here is it's adopted a, a certain kind of race classification and it's defended it as a police powers measure. And so Louisiana is saying that as long as a race classification has a reasonable purpose attached to a public good, then it has to be permissible. That, that, and, and Brown, Justice Brown, agrees with that, that uh, he says that, well, look, you know, it's a common thing that, uh, that state governments practice school segregation. It's a common thing that there are laws concerning intermarriage with regard to the, uh, the, the racial groups. Um, it's a relatively common thing or becoming more, I'm not sure if we want to say it's a governmental thing, but at least it's a common customary thing that, uh, that there is this segregation, uh, transportation conveyances and so forth, that this is within the tradition of, the, of uh, US law and practice, both North and South. Um, and, so, and so you can't understand the 14th Amendment as being intended to undo all of that and subsequent rulings have reaffirmed that. Um, and so that's Brown's argument. The race classifications are permitted so long as they're reasonable and not invidious. Uh, and Harlan's argument is, again, kind of uh, building on what we said a few minutes ago, that <clears throat> both the 13th Amendment the 13th Amendment is to be understood broadly. It not only abolishes slavery and involuntary servitude, um, but it also, what it is really is an anti-caste piece of amendment or a piece of uh, constitutional law. So it forbids the establishment of classes, you know, at least the establishment of such classes as would uh, designate one as superior, one as, uh, as inferior. Um, it puts everybody on a plane of legal equality. Um, it forbids any kind of arbitrary classification and race is first and foremost among those. The 13th, he thinks, already does that. The 14th reaffirms that mm. in the citizenship clause. It, mm. is a, it is an attempt to establish Republican government in, its, in the purity of its principle, which is, which is equality under the law in the exercise of, of civil rights and that categorically forbids race classification. That's right. I, if I can add to that, I just would sure. say that that's exactly right. And there you see the connection between the 13th and 14th Amendment in Harlan's thinking. The 13th Amendment doesn't just do away with chattel slavery. It restores, it establishes essentially by restoring universal civil freedom, universal freedom of, of human beings. And what the 14th Amendment does is then sort of transfuses that into citizenship. It then makes citizenship understood in light of universal freedom of human beings. Mm -hmm. And so citizens have the same way. And I think that helps us understand why the very famous line where he says, our constitution is colorblind. And then it makes a reference to caste, neither knows mm -hmm. nor tolerates yeah. uh, classes and castes among citizens. Mm -hmm. And then it's important because it says the law regards man as man. And explicitly, translates the idea of, of a free, naturally free human being established by the 13th Amendment into what our understanding of citizenship should be, which is as a citizen, you have a right to be regarded by the law simply as a human being. The law regards man as man. Mm. And when you're talking about the civil rights of citizenship, therefore, it's important, I think that phrase colorblind is sometimes we pass over it too quickly. Right. Because remember, he's replying to an argument that Brown made. Brown made the argument that, look, this is just a reason. We have to presume it's a reasonable police power regulation, like so many other reasonable police power regulations. For public safety and order and all the rest. But but Harlan wants to say, no, there's something particular about this regulation that puts it outside the police powers. And that's because it involves classification by race. So it's not like a speed limit. It's not like a, 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 a public sanitation order or something like that because it involves classification by race and the law is colorblind, which means it literally does not have the power to see race. Mm -hmm. It cannot see a citizen's color. And therefore, mm -hmm. it simply doesn't have that power. And why doesn't it have that power? Because the principles of a government 
reaffirmed in the 13th Amendment talk about the rights of human beings and citizens irrespective of their color and without regard to their color. Mm -hmm. So if your rights don't depend on your color and the law's job is to protect your rights as a citizen, the law literally has no reason to see your color in the very first place. So it is colorblind. And so even if this is a legitimate, well-intended exercise of the police power, it's simply outside the scope of the state's powers now under the 13th and 14th Amendments. So it's a, I think it's a very broad and sweeping mm-hmm. argument, but, but, but it's based on the notion that government simply doesn't have the power to see the race of its citizens. There's a little and bit Brown's, of- Brown's response to that, at least the 13th Amendment argument, would be to say, why are we talking about the 13th Amendment? The 13th Amendment has nothing to do with this case or with this law because the 13th Amendment is just about slavery. I think at one point Brown even says that is too clear for argument. We shouldn't even be arguing right over the, the 13th Amendment. And his response to Harlan's 14th Amendment argument, you guys correct me if I'm wrong here, would be to say something like there's a, there's a distinction to be made between uh, uh, civil or political equality or civil and political liberty on the one hand versus social equality or social liberty on the other hand. Is, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, that is, that is right. The, the social equality idea is very important uh, to 19th century Americans. And it's a concept that's kind of gone out of our, our legal usage um, in the 20th and 21st centuries. But it's very important in this case, at least with regard to uh, the, the, majority, um, the majority ruling here. Because Brown is saying, look, if, if we are talking about um, a, a, a civil rights proper, uh, then the sense is that, you know, then there is something of a tradition even early on of court rulings um, that, would, that would have vindicated the claim of somebody like Plessy, if it were a genuine civil right. In other words, if Plessy were being prevented from traveling, you know, uh, in, in this case, or prevented from, well, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. I'm gonna get myself in trouble. If, if, his, if his property rights were being violated, uh, then, uh, then, uh, uh, then, then maybe Brown sympathizes with him. The the case that uh, that Tourget draws upon some, and that and that Harlan draws upon some, and finds some good quotations to support his position. I think Brown would also say the Justice Brown would also say is supportive of his. There's a case Strada versus West Virginia, uh, in which um, there's a West Virginia law essentially that excluded blacks from jury duty and jury service. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and this is an 1880 case. And it was, that law was invalidated by the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said in invalidating that is that the, I can't quote it quite exactly, but the law has to be the same for people irrespective of color, which looks like a declaration of colorblindness. And that's the part that Harlan draws on. And the part that uh, the Justice Brown would draw on is, that, no, this is a clear example of a civil right. Uh, jury service is essential to the protections of person and property that, uh, that, that are the, the rationale for civil rights. Um, social equality is different. You know, you can, um, you know, the, the, the right to travel to get from point A to point B within a state is not disturbed by the Louisiana law. It's really only the right to ride in the company of somebody of, uh, of, of a different color. Um, and for Brown, that's an instance of social equality. Um, and so for Brown, you know, there's a, other instances of social equality would be, let's say, the assertion that there have to be integrated, racially integrated schools or that intermarriage laws are unconstitutional. Here, we're getting to something in 19th century, late 19th century public opinion that underlies to some extent this Jim Crow regime. Um, the, the great fear is miscegenation. Um, and it's partly, this is partly a Darwinian fear on the part of the people who consider themselves the dominant and superior race. They don't want race mixing because they think it's a degradation. They think that that's what, uh, that's what Darwinism teaches, uh, which is the science of the day. Um, and uh, and so when you start to shade over into the social equality 
that suggests that um, the law somehow protects either miscegenation or opportunities that would give rise to it, then that's different from, from uh, then you're outside the realm of civil rights. That's the way that, that Justice Brown is thinking about it. When Martin Luther King Jr. says in the dream speech that he dreams of America in which, you know, little black boys and, and, uh, and uh, you know, and black girls will be holding hands with little white boys and white girls in school, that sounds kind of sweet and innocent, but that's, in a, that's a sort of in-your-face assertion of the idea of social equality. Um, and that was a thing that made 19th century, a lot of 19th century white Americans very uneasy. So that, that's one of the, the, that's, I think, the, the backdrop of this, of this argument about social equality. If I can just connect that to something, it's not surprising that Harlan would be making an argument like this because that's the same argument that he makes in dissent in the civil rights cases. Yeah. In that case, he's talking about public accommodations. And his argument there is, is the same argument that's underlying his position here, which is when you are in a public space or in a public accommodation, you are a citizen. Mm -hmm. so we're talking about your civil rights and not a matter of social equality like who, who your friend is, for example. So his argument was the public space, the civil space, has to be fully open, and it's a right that you enjoy as a citizen, whether that's a public accommodation like an opera house or a restaurant, or whether in this case it's a, it's a rail car. Harlan calls this a kind of paranoia. You know, there's a point in, in, uh, in his dissent, I'm trying to find it as I'm talking to you, when he says, you know, there are 60 million white people in this country and there are 8 million blacks and the 8 million are not, he says 60 million, this is the exact quotation, 60 millions of whites are in no danger from the presence here of 8 millions of, of blacks. Uh, and uh, somewhere else uh, in the, yeah, he goes a little bit farther down the following paragraph to talk about, about social equality. Um, and he's very dismissive of the social equality argument that the, that the majority make, because at least he's dismissive in the sense that he says it has no reasonable application here. You're sitting next to somebody or in the same car, not even next to them, in the same car as someone on a train. Um, this doesn't establish anything that really deserves the name social equality, that would confer an equality of status or somehow, you know, a right to intrude upon the associations, you know, of, uh, of somebody else. So that's, anyway, that's, uh, hmm. that's Harlan's response to that point. Interesting. I, I know we're, we're very quickly running out of time and we, we could continue talking about this document for, for, for another hour easily. Um, but you, you both had mentioned earlier um, that this is a case, this is a document that, that's not very well understood. Um, even the connection to, to Brown v. Board was brought up. Now, my, my understanding is that I, um, it's, it's, um, it's popular to think that Brown v. Board in the mid-20th century is a vindication of, of Harlan. Right. Um, is, is that right? Is, is Harlan colorblind constitution vindicated because again my understanding is that the court in brown doesn't rely the court in brown v board doesn't rely on harlan's reading of the constitution um mm -hmm. in that case yeah um is that I, is that true that's true one of the myths i mm -hmm. think of brown v board and also of plessy is that um notwithstanding the, the the constitutional and moral power of justice harlan's dissent and it is one of the great lone dissents in American constitutional history, it's, it's never been accepted by the court. Um, and Justice Brennan actually points this out in an affirmative action case <clears throat> in the 20th century. It's not the basis of the court's ruling in Brown versus Board of Education in 1954. And it's not ever been, certainly not unanimously been endorsed by the court. And I would be hard pressed to find a case where you have a significant majority of the court, even to this day in 2020, that has adopted. Individual justices have. Justice Thomas, for example, has openly called for an endorsement of that position, but it has not actually been adopted. So it's a it's a dissent that's had enormous um, moral and rhetorical power, but less constitutional authority. Yeah. The the. In, in one case, 
I mean, to my knowledge, maybe there are more. The court came very close. But I think the, the closest the court ever came was in the Parents versus Seattle case, a, a, a different kind of school uh, integration case um, in which you had, you know, Justice Roberts wrote the majority ruling. It was a five to four ruling. And you had four out of the five of that majority were willing to endorse Harlan's colorblind constitution. Um, and only Justice Kennedy was the swing vote who agreed with the conclusion, but he didn't want to go so far as to as to rule out race classifications at all. That I think is the yeah. closest the court has ever come, but it but it has not ever affirmed Harlan's uh, dissent, and it certainly did not do so in Brown versus Board. So you yeah, why, why is that? Do you think we've because we've got a question from one of our one of our yeah. participants who, yeah, who yeah, asked yeah. about uh, affirmative action opponents. They use the colorblind. Yeah. Uh, excerpt to defend their position is 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 that part of the reason why the court has never affirmed yeah, I, I want to speak to that. I'm I don't know if that's I don't think that's the motivation in the actual mm -hmm. Brown versus Board ruling, but it it quickly became part of the the court's motivation. I think that's probably a fair way to put it. In Brown versus Board. The court is very sensitive to the need for a unanimous decision. It knows it's going to do something very controversial in invalidating segregation as such in K through 12 schools. And so it wants to be as, um, what should I say, as traditional as possible, as respectful of judicial tradition as possible, because it needs to do that to keep some wavering justices on board. And so that means that the Brown court goes out of its way in a sense to be nice to the Plessy court. Uh, and the way it does that is, if you notice, I mean, the, the test that I read a little while ago when Justice Brown says, look, you know, if a classification um, is invidious, you know, if it's intended to stigmatize or oppress or something, then I would rule it unconstitutional. I just don't think this one does. This one has legitimate police powers purpose. Well, that's exactly the test that, the, that is used in Brown versus Board, uh, except it's just on the minor premise, on the empirical point, the, the Brown versus Borg court comes to the conclusion that this particular classification of students in public schools does stigmatize. So it's invalidated because it has this particular effect, or so the court thinks, on uh, the, uh, the, the, the self-esteem of students. It harms their self-understanding. And that's why it's invalidated, because it has so the idea is in Brown v. Board that race classifications get invalidated when they have particular bad consequences. That's not saying they're categorically invalid, which is what Harlan wanted them to say. So I think that it's in, in the Brown ruling, it's the Brown v. Board ruling, it's a kind of wariness about being too radical. Then it becomes um, a more you know, a, a shield later on against uh, against assertions of colorblindness that would um, uh, uh, that would invalidate quote unquote benign race classifications like uh, like uh, like race preferences. Um, when uh, the the question from Spencer, the comment is affirmative action opponents use the colorblind excerpt to defend their position. They do, and they're exactly right in the sense that. Uh, that, that it, I think, is the implication of what Justice Harlan plainly says, that, uh, that quote unquote remedial race classifications would be every bit as unconstitutional as, uh, as invidious ones. Mm -hmm. But that's not Justice Henry Brown's principle, and it's not Justice Warren's principle in, um, in Brown versus Board. Just add to that, that had the court in, in 1954 adopted Harlan's dissent, you know, part, part of the reason they can get unanimity is, of course, there's lots of previous cases chipping away at separate but equal established by Plessy. Yep. And then we get to Brown v. Board, and a lot of the groundwork has been laid for undermining the separate but equal doctrine. And it, it's particular and focused on schools, which is again, not, not a, an accident. It's the NAACP's legal strategy. But to adopt Harlan's um, dissent as the court's ruling in, in, in Brown v. Board would, of course, have m massive implications for lots of racial right. segregation outside of schools. Mm. Right. That's, yeah. too, that's too big to do yeah. for the court in 1954. Mm. Can, I, can I make one further point? Um, 
one one additional uh, dimension of the proposition that uh, the Plessy the, rule, the Plessy ruling isn't widely understood was just stated by Jeff, um, and, and I, I want to bring it out a little more emphatically. That is that Justice Harlan, near the end of his dissent in Plessy, says that this decision, it's in the part where he compares the decision to Dred Scott, and he says this is going to have very, very pernicious consequences. Um, and that's the way that, uh, that I think the, the, the conventional opinion thinks about Plessy, that it opened up the way for 50, 60 years of a Jim Crow regime of segregation, of no racial progress. And that's not correct as, a, as an understanding of how the Plessy ruling actually did behave as a precedent. The, the NAACP, just as Jeff said, um, uh, picked up the strategy kind of that uh, Tourget and Martinet um, uh, initiated in this case, and they chipped away at Plessy. Um, and they chipped away at it because they used the formulation of separate but equal or equal but separate. But the emphasis was on the equality. So the idea is you can have your separate institutions, but they have to be equal. And most of the separate institutions were not, in fact, equal. So they could get invalidated without actually overturning the, the Plessy ruling. And a series of them did. In, uh, and pretty early on, this begins in the 19 teens, and then it extends uh, all the way up to all the way up to Brown versus Board. Um, so that's kind of a, and, and there's another interesting little footnote historically here that Justice Henry Brown, who wrote Plessy, um, wrote also uh, an article, a kind of commemoration, a memorial article for Justice Harlan when Harlan died in 1911. The article comes out in 1912. In that article, he talks about Harlan's dissents. He doesn't say a great deal about the Plessy dissent, but he does say, that he thinks that Harlan was probably right about the intention of the legislature. Mm -hmm. um, so th there's, a, there's a hint of embarrassment about the ruling um, that uh, the Justice Henry Brown uh, will, will eventually express about 15 years later. All right. Well, on that note, unfortunately, we're going to have to, to draw things to a close now. Again, we could you know, go on for another hour easily. Uh, and, and probably uh, many more talking about this, this document. Um, but thanks to our panelists, gentlemen, thank you, uh, as well as thanks to our participants uh, for some great questions. We didn't get to all of them. I saw one came in there right at the end. Unfortunately, we're already out of time, but you know, thanks to all involved. Uh, as a reminder, you will be receiving an email within the next week that will include a link for a certificate of participation. It will also contain a link to the archived webinar which we hope you'll share with your colleagues as well as on social media. If you've enjoyed today's webinar, please consider taking an online graduate course in our MAG program, our Masters of American History and Government program. You can find more information about online course offerings as well as many other resources for teachers at teachingamericanhistory.org. Our next Documents in Detail webinar will take place on Wednesday, March 25th, when our topic will be the 1912 Progressive Party Platform. Uh, joining us then will be Drs. Chris Burkett and David Alvis. Uh, also, uh, mark your calendars March 7th at 11 a.m. Eastern, the next installment in our American Mind series will take place. Uh, the subject of our, of our uh, discourse at that time will be Jane Addams. Um, looking forward to that. Uh, and we look forward to seeing all of you back here uh, in March. Thank you. Our next Documents in Detail webinar will take place on March 25th and will be about the 1912 Progressive Party platform. We also have an upcoming Saturday webinar on March 7th on Jane Addams. You can find out information about all these upcoming programs and past programs at taah.org slash programs slash webinars or from the programs link on the homepage. Thanks for joining us.